Man, I'm glad to be here today. I'm, I'm thankful for his grace. I'm thankful for his mercy. I'm thankful, Lord, our Lord doesn't give up on us. I'm thankful for his word, that it's alive, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, and it still applies to us today. It is still 100% true. You can stand on it, you can bank on it, you can trust in it. It is God's way of communicating with us to to explain and to, to give details and information on who he is. To think that, that sinful people like, like me and like you can have a relationship with a holy God should leave us in awe. And I'm thankful for the blood of Jesus that takes away the, the sins of the world. It's taken away my sin, and if you're a follower of Christ today, it's taken away your sin. He remembers it no more. Wow. Amen. Amen. Today we're going to be looking in the book of James. Uh, last week I described the studying James as going to the, to the dentist and getting a root canal with no Novocaine. I mean, it can be painful at times uh, because James, James is very pointed. Uh, there, there's not much gray matter when the way James wrote. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is very... Uh, no nonsense type of writer. He just gets straight to the point. And in James 1 1, remember, he, he identifies himself. James was the half brother of Jesus. He, he, didn't, he didn't throw out the, the relative card, he didn't throw out the apostle card, he didn't throw out any, I was the, the, the leader of the church of Jerusalem. He identified himself as a bond servant of Christ, that his will was swallowed up in the will of Christ. So we've been going through this journey of James, and James uh, chapter 2, verses 14 through 26 is what we're going to look at today. And, and when we look at this passage, before we go any further, I, please put your contacts in so you can hear me, okay? All right? I, I need you to listen to me. If you don't hear me say anything else today, listen to this. God loves you. He loves you. He loves you and me and the world so much that he gave his only son to pay the price for for my sin and for your sin and the sins of the world. He loves us. And when we look at a passage like we're about to look at today, I don't want you to question God's love because he loves us enough for us to, to have to examine ourselves to who we are. We're going to be looking at uh, a a topic about faith, about genuine faith versus counterfeit faith. But before we go any further, I just want you to know I'm feeling real sharp today, okay? Uh, You know, most of you will say I'm sharp as a marble. I understand. I get that, okay? But I, I feel pretty sharp today because it is a Rolex kind of Sunday, okay? Oh, Dad, Big Poppy's got his Rolex on, Okay? Now, this, this is a very special Rolex, okay? This is a Rolex that my son, when he was 14 years old, he saved his money. He saved his money because he was going to buy his dad a gift, a gift that shows his love for his dad. So he saved his money, and he was, you know, one of the students back in the student group, and they took a choir tour to New York City. And my son... Brought me back a Rolex. He loved me so much that he spent $12 to buy me a Rolex. When I got it, it was not working, okay? It says Rolex on it. It it is a good-looking watch, okay? But I'll be honest with you. I spent more money to get a watch band and a battery than he paid for it, okay? It says Rolex. It says Rolex on the front. It looks sharp on the back. It's got Rolex printed in it. I mean, it looks like the real deal Holyfield. But those of you that know me well know that Jeff McFarlane would never spend any kind of money to get a Rolex. I just don't care. 
You know, I couldn't tell if this was real or fake until I put a battery in it. And when I put a battery in this, the, the telltale sign, whether you have a real Rolex or you have a fake Rolex, is you look at the second hand. And if the second hand is ticking, tick, 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 you have a genuine imitation. If that second hand sweeps, it's just a fluid motion, you have a genuine Rolex. I'm looking at this one, tick, 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 tick. It's not the real deal. It's a fake. Some of Satan's most prized trophies are people in the church, are people who come to a building called a church. We sing songs, we listen to sermons, we give some money into an offering plate, but we're never different. The Bible says, it puts it this way, that we have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. Today, we're going to talk about a genuine faith versus a counterfeit faith. We're going to look at what that looks like. So let's read God's Word, and let's dig into this awesome passage Starting uh, James chapter 2, verse 14, and we're going to read through the end of the chapter through verse 26, okay? And it says this, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are, are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you not know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which it says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works, and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. What is faith? What is faith? You know, the scripture says in Ephesians, we're saved by grace through faith, and that's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. It's, it's not of works so that no man should boast. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, it says that we should walk by faith and not by sight. Hebrews says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. In Romans chapter 14, verse 23, it says, whatever is done apart from faith is sin. You go back to Hebrews 11, and faith is, is, is described in, in, in Hebrews 11, the evidence of things hoped for, the, the, the assurance of things not seen. Nobody in this room has seen God. Nobody in this room has ever seen Jesus. We, we read about him in this book called the Bible. It is true. We read about his love. We sing about his love. We talk about his love. But something has to happen 
We were, we were dead in our sins. We were, by nature, children of wrath. We were sons of disobedience, children of disobedience. But God, because of his great love, even when we were dead in our sin, he made us alive together in Christ Jesus. We were dead, and Jesus made us alive. And one of the first things he gave us was the gift of faith. The gift to be able to believe. We're saved by grace through faith, and that's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, so that no man should boast. I was reading a, a, a commentary by Warren Wiersbe, and I, man, he, he, he hits the nail on the head with this definition of faith. Listen to it. It's in your notes. I want you to fill in the blanks there. And point number one, faith is not believing in spite of evidence, but obeying in spite of consequence. Faith is not just believing when you don't have physical evidence that you see with your eyes, when you don't have the ability, it's not rational, it's not logic. Faith is is obeying. It's obeying the word of God. It's daily living out the word of God despite the consequences. And I'm just going to tell you, church family, if we're followers of Jesus and we're living by by this book, and the Holy Spirit is guiding us and leading us to live by this book, there will be consequences because the world hates this book. Because the world hates God and hates his way. You take a hard stand as a follower of Christ. And even if you do it in the most loving and compassionate way, you're going to be called a bigot. You're going to be called narrow-minded. If you say, if you take the stand, what truth says, there is only one way to the Father, and that is through Jesus. He is the way, the truth, the life. If you take that stance, you're a narrow-minded bigot today. You live this, there's going to be consequences. As we go through, through this life, a life of faith. And so there's this, this, this comparison of what real faith looks like, a live faith versus dead faith. A genuine faith versus my Rolex faith, okay? What does that look like? Let's look at what a, what a counterfeit faith looks like, okay? Let's look at, go back uh, to James chapter 2. Look at point 2 on your outline. Let's look at verses 15 through 16. It says, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of, them, um, one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? A, a counterfeit faith is a faith of words. You see... You see a brother or a sister. You see somebody. You see a human being with the same nature as you and me. We, we see a human being, and they are in need. And I'll, I'll just put it in, in southern terms. You look at them and go, well, bless your heart. Bless your heart. Let me pray for you. And you walk on, and you show no compassion. You show no grace. You show no mercy. Well, they they got drug issues. They got alcohol issues. Well, hey, we all got issues, people. I do. You do. Just some of them are more obvious. We just do a real good job of covering ours up. I tell you what, I got free when I stopped trying to cover mine up. It just, I am who I am. Stains and all. This counterfeit faith is, 
is one that's in word only. John 1, uh, 3, 17 and 18. Write that passage down. I want you to go back and visit it again today or next week or, or this week. It says this, but whoever has this world's good and sees his brother in need and shuts his heart up from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or tongue, but in deed and truth. I've mentioned this before. I'm going to mention it again. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've been trained to do evangelism, and I've been trained to reach masses, reach a lot of people. And the problem with reaching masses is you don't meet people. You don't know names. You don't know stories. I'm, I'm not knocking that type of evangelism. I'm just saying to, today, you need to know names. You need to know stories. You, you, you need to know about life. You need to be a friend. And in these, in these evangelism uh, trainings, most, almost all the time, they always say the message never changes. And they are exactly right. The message never changes. The gospel is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ is still the good news. Jesus still saves. Amen? It never changes, and it won't change. He is the way. But in these trainings, they'll say, you know what, but the, the, the message never changes, but the method does. So do you really think that the God of creation, the God that has ordered our steps, would give us this most awesome, awesome message, this awesome gospel, this good news, and say, hey, you just got to figure out the rest on your own. You think he works that way? I don't. I think he gave us the message, and I think the message never changes. And he also gave us the method, and the method never changes. And the method is found in John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. I've hit on this before, but we're going to hit on it again. You want to you wanna be sincere? You want to be real? You hang out with sinful people to impact them with the gospel of Christ. You get to know them. You get to know about their families. You be real with them. You love them just the way they are, just the way Christ loved you and me. Then the last verse, last part of verse 14, it says he was full of grace and truth. Most evangelism programs are going to teach you the truth. And, and I believe, don't hear what I'm not saying, church. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We have to share God's word, okay? But God has an order in the way he does things. Jesus was full of grace and truth. And a lot of times, you know what? We just want to beat the tar out of people with truth and we don't give them grace, and you know what? Grace is what softens the heart to receive the truth. And we share truth, and we share truth in the wrong motive, in the wrong way, and we don't give grace first. Man, we we don't get to know people. We don't want to be friends with people. We just want to get them to come to church and baptize them. Grace and truth, grace and truth. And a counterfeit faith says, you know what? I just, I really don't care about people. If, if you don't, if your heart doesn't break for lost people, if your heart doesn't break for your lost neighbors, if your heart doesn't break For the person in the cubicle next to you that's lost his last year's Easter egg? If it's just about me and mine, I'm going to get my salvation. And I'm not worried about the rest of the world. You really, 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 really need to stop and just think, 
do I have genuine faith or do I have a counterfeit? No compassion. Compassion is action. It is, it is, it is love in action. And we see that person in need. And it says, you know what? I, I, I want to I help. I want to clothe. I want to feed. You can't ever go wrong on, on the side of compassion. Where, where would we be today? Where would we be without the compassion of Jesus? Think about that for a while. Where would you be if he was only judge? But he's a compassionate and a gracious judge, and he loves us. And that counterfeit faith, you know what? It's, it's in word only. We can quote the word of God. Uh, when, when I lived downtown, um, uh, where, where Chad almost got arrested that, that day, uh, it was a great story. Uh, uh, I mean, Christy, I mean, you almost married a felon. There was a guy there. We, we'd have Bible study every day, and he grew up. He, was, he was, grew up in an orphanage in a home, and he, it was a Christian home, and he could quote more Scripture. And, man, you're sitting there doing Bible study, and it, it really didn't matter what passage. He could quote it. He knew the Scripture. He could quote it. <laughs> but when Bible study is over, and let me just say he wasn't quoting Scripture, Okay. Man, he, he would cuss so much, it'd make a sailor blush, man. I mean, he, 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 it was just words. And when, when, the, when, when our faith is just something we speak but we don't live out, we got to really examine ourselves to see if we are of the faith. Is this counterfeit or not? When our faith is just an intellectual faith, when it's just information that we're getting, uh, I mean, this, this young man had a lot of information, and we're not studying this, this book right here for information. We're studying this book for transformation, okay, for a changed life. And you know what? As God is changing our lives, our, our hearts are more tender. Our hearts are more compassionate, and we will reach people, and we will be compassionate with people. Counterfeit Christians, you know what, are some of the most miserable people on the planet. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. They could suck oatmeal through a water hose. Think about it, okay. Okay, it was good. The proof is not in the spoken word. The proof is not in the intellect. That is not proof of salvation. It's not proof of what we know here. And we've been asking you as a church family, and we've been praying and fasting for our pastor. And you know, you think about, you think about the process of finding a new pastor. It's, it's a man that we don't know. It's a man that we don't have the privilege of, of examining his life. And all we have to go by is his degrees and what he says. Church family, we got to pray and we got to fast. Because we don't want a pastor that just has intellect and we don't want a pastor that just preaches good. Trudy and I get to travel and we get to meet with a lot of pastors and a lot of church staffs. And the majority of the pastors, when I ask, how, how can we help you? How can Trek, how can our missions organization help you and serve you? Could you, could you help us? I'm, I'm really struggling. The majority of our church is not evangelistic. They just won't share their faith. And I, and I stop. And it's just as respectful as I know how to. I ask the pastor this. Be, be honest with me. How many people have you led to the Lord outside of the pulpit how many people have you personally led to the Lord? 
this year. And the majority of them, it is totally silence. Because they know what to say. But their life isn't preaching that I'm a, I'm a proclaimer of the gospel, not just on Sunday morning, but every day I live. It's in word and it's in intellect. And there's no passion in it. Uh, Trudy and I, in, in September, September the 7th, we'll be celebrating uh, 34 years of marriage. 34. Y'all pray for that lady. I mean, wow. And I can't tell you how many times in 34 years I've told Trudy I love her. Me telling Trudy I love her by me saying it does not prove my love for my wife. It doesn't prove it, no matter how many times I say it. Kids, kids spell love, T-I-M-E, and so do wives, men. It do, if, if what I say doesn't match the way I live, she won't believe it. No, proof is not in what I say. Proof is in how I act. It's the way I live. Does, does the watch tick or does it, does it sweep? Is it real or is it counterfeit? Let's look, let's look at, a, at a, real, a real genuine faith and a live faith. First of all, it is intellectual, okay? I, I can't say, you know what? It, it is intellectual, but it doesn't stop there. We, we hear the word of God. It comes in in our mind. We hear it. We listen to it. But something supernatural happens that the spirit of the living God speaks to our spirit. And it doesn't stop just being an intellectual. You don't just memorize it. It starts changing the way we live our lives. It starts with intellect. It starts with hearing. But then there's an application, and we're actually living out the Word of God day by day. It's spoken. We do speak the Word of God. We have to speak God's Word. We give grace we give truth. We speak God's word. It's lived out. It's, it's lived out through obedience, no matter what the consequences is. It leads to action. If we can sit up underneath the word of God every day, every Sunday, listen to sermons, do Bible studies, and walk out these doors and not love our wives as Christ loved the church, not be Christ in our homes. Our vocabulary doesn't change. The way we live doesn't change. No, a genuine faith, it is a process, okay? I wish we just took a pill and we were holy, boom. It just doesn't work that way. It is a day-by-day -day process where each day we look less like the world, where each day we react less like the world, and we look more like Christ. And it happens as we read God's Word and as we obey God's Word. We walk in radical obedience like it said when it talked about Abraham. Abraham just didn't have a verbal or intellectual faith. I mean, try and get your head wrapped around Abraham and his only son, Isaac. And he lays his only son, Isaac, on the altar. And God has promised him. God has promised him that through Isaac, he's going to bless the nations. He's made a covenant with him. Do you think there was a war going on in that man's head? There was a battle, there was a war, and he takes his son and he takes the, he takes the wood and he builds an altar. 
and he lays his son on the altar. You wonder what Isaac's thinking about right now? Yo, Dad, hey, what's up? It wasn't just intellectual. He didn't just say, I'm going to do it. Abraham actually raised the knife and was coming down. He was going to do it because something had to happen in him where he believed, you know what, I know my God made a promise. I know he's not a liar. He spoke the truth. I'm killing him, he'll raise him from the dead. I don't know what's going to happen, but my God told me to offer my only son Isaac and I'm going to do it. Man, that's some radical faith right there. I'm going to obey God in spite of the consequences. A genuine faith, you know what? We serve God out of passion. Not of obligation and duty. I got to pay taxes. Anybody here get just jacked up and excited about paying taxes? But it's my duty, it's my obligation as an American citizen, I pay my taxes. And if I don't, I'll go to jail. So will you. Uh, it's duty, it's obligation. A genuine faith doesn't serve God out of duty and obligation. If reading the Word of God is something we got to do, if praying to the living creation, creator of this, of this creation is something we got to do, we got to ask ourselves, do we have a real faith or a genuine faith? If coming to worship on Sunday with our brothers and sisters and hearing the Word of God to be equipped to go out and reach a lost world is something we got to do, it's duty and it's obligation. If sharing the gospel is something we got to do, well, I'm going to do it because if I don't do it, I'm going to have a bad day. If I don't do it, God's going to get me. Wow. I've had those thoughts. I've had those thoughts. No, this Christian life is not something we have to do. It's something that we get to do. We do it out of passion, and we do it out of love, and we do it out because, you know what? He has lavished his grace and his mercy on us. He hasn't given us what we deserve. It's, it just doesn't stop with intellect and words. God is radically transforming the way we live from the inside out. So Rolex watch. I don't know why I've kept this thing for 22 years, but I've kept this watch for 22 years. And you know, the only way that we can fix that second hand from ticking and make it sweep, it don't matter what it looks like on the outside. You got to change the inside. Those who are in Christ are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, everything is new. I want to ask you a question and then we're going to pray. Are you new? Is your life different? Do you know that you know that you know? In my life, I'm right with God. I'm a child of God. I tell you what, genuine faith is a struggle. It is a war. The other day, I didn't think I was a Christian. I'll just be honest with you. I had a rough morning. It was hot. I was riding around in Trudy's old dad, her, uh, Trudy's dad's old pickup truck, uh, 1990 Ford Blackie. Went to the bank, had 10 minutes to get from the bank to my next meeting. Pulled out of the bank, got about a block, had a flat tire on the front truck, on the front tire. 
I'm like, I'm a grown man. I could change a tire in about five minutes. I'll get this thing done. Well, it's not my truck. I don't know where anything is. So it took me 10 minutes to find the jack and the crank and all this stuff, and I finally found it. Uh, by the way, this, this jack has not ever been used since 1990. So I put that crank in there, and I start cranking. And I start cussing. Because I'm hitting my knuckles on the asphalt every time I make that crank, okay? I'm not happy. I got a meeting to go to, and by this time, I am a sweaty mess. I sweat in the igloo, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sweaty. So I get the jack as high as it'll, as it'll go, and it wouldn't get the tire off. So I pull, crank the jack back down. Actually, I snatched it out. And, uh, and I put it in a different spot. And I go over this, this whole process again, raking my knuckles, raking my knuckles, raking my knuckles. And I get it up, and I'm like, finally. So I got it, and it was just barely enough room. I take the, uh, the spare off, and then I had to go figure out how to get the other spare, uh, get, the, get the spare off the back. I drop the spare, put it on. Spare's been on there since 1990. Tighten the lug nuts, drop the tire, spare was flat. <laughs> Golly was not the words I was saying, okay? I was mad and I was angry. I'm like, Lord, am I, I ain't even acting like a Christian. And this lady drove by and asked me, Sugar? Are you all right? I'm like, no! I'm not all right. How can I go to my meeting like this? Folks, we're not talking about sinless perfection. We're talking about a process of sanctification that's happening where every day we're looking more like the world, more like Jesus and less like the world. Is that happening in your life and in my life? I'm telling you, today we're going to have an altar call. And I don't want you to leave this building with a counterfeit faith. You examine yourself to see if you're of the faith. And let God's word be the standard. Don't, you know what? You might can change your tire and not cuss at all. But don't compare yourself to me. You compare yourself to Jesus. Because that's who we're going to be judged like. Don't leave this place. Our staff's going to be down here. I'm going to turn this microphone off. You don't have to worry about anybody hearing you. But I'm telling you, don't leave this place with a counterfeit faith. I, I want to know that I know that I know. I don't want to just believe. The demons believe and tremble. I want to know. Father, would you lead us? Holy Spirit, examine our hearts. Lord, do we have a genuine faith or do we have the real faith? And I pray, Father, that your spirit would speak to our spirits and we'd be obedient to do what you tell us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.